it's a pleasure to be talking with you about trees. Um, as Tom mentioned, there's a lot of small trees, a lot of large trees. What I like about the small trees, they give you a little bit more intimate close up of, uh, of a tree in your landscape, in your yard. You may have large trees that form the fra framework of your landscape, but the smaller trees can offer quite a bit more for you uh, within, within a landscape. So with that, uh, what I'm going to do is just go through some of the small trees and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what's considered a small tree. Uh, you know, we're, we're all familiar with elms and ash and spruce, which are 50, 60, 70 foot tall. But uh, smaller trees are, are pretty much uh, only about a half to third of that size. So we're talking about on the, on the very small end, maybe 8 to 10 feet in height, and then up to uh, the, larger, uh, the larger of the small end, maybe about 25 to 30 feet in height. So um, they're, they're quite a bit smaller than the large trees growing in your yard. They can be single-stemmed. They can be grown in a multi-stem form. They are, their spread can be equal to their height. Their spread can be very narrow. There's a lot of selections that have gone on in the ornamental world for landscape type uh, ornamental trees, small ornamental trees. The flip side of that is you can have taller growing shrubs that can occasionally be pruned into small trees. If any of you have seen common lilac, which are 50, 60 years old in the landscape, they're actually uh, oftentimes trimmed into a small multi-stem tree. Now there are large growing trees, there's cultivars selected from very large growing trees that, are, that have been selected to grow in a small tree form. So some of these things shift back and forth and are maybe not always what we consider large or small within a certain species. So with that, um, most people when you talk about small ornamental trees, what is what is usually comes to mind? Um, crab apples are probably one of the first ones. Crab apples are are uh, very common throughout our area, very hardy, provide a spring bloom. Uh, there's many to choose from. And uh, what I say here, that's an entirely different discussion than what I'm gonna do tonight. I am not a crab apple specialist. Uh, there are many forms and features of crabs. And uh, I'll talk in a few minutes where you can look some of those up, but we're not gonna talk about those tonight. Uh, amber maples, probably the most commonly planted maple across our state, a small maple. A uh, number of different cultivars and selections, and I am going to touch on those. The other thing was, which we see a lot of in our landscapes are the purple leaf choke cherry, the Canada cherry, the uh, or called Schubert choke cherry. Um, it's hard to put a plant like in. I consider the foliage kind of garish, hard to fit into a landscape. But a lot of people like that purplish brown foliage that they have. But in my mind, they just have too many problems. Uh, they sucker just horribly in a landscape, difficult to control. Uh, there's a number of disease problems that they have. You can see on the slide there, that's an example of black knot, which is pretty rampant in the uh, choke cherries and, and their uh, hybrids, uh, often called uh, poop on a stick. So if you really wanna have a, a, a noteworthy fungus in your yard, that, that's what you have with black knot. And there's also a number of bacterial and fungal leaf spot diseases. So it's a, it's a plant that I really don't recommend. It's great out in a wildlife planting. It's great out in a shelter belt planting. But when we put it in a the landscape, there's a lot of problems that develop from it. So I'm not going to be discussing the purple leaf choke cherries tonight either. As I mentioned, I did want to come back to crab apple just a minute because there are hundreds of cultivars. There's a lot of work that's been done, and a lot of work that's been done at NDSU over the years. And uh, there are so many, so many differences in crab apples. Um, <coughs> disease resistance is probably the biggest one we look for. Flower color, flower duration, fruit characteristics, uh, the form. Crab apples now are everything from widespreading to very narrow, upright to fit into landscapes. Uh, different rootstock. So if you're interested in crab apples, I've listed a few uh, sources here. The first one is a publication you can find on the internet. Just look up. Choice Flowering Crab Apple Cultivars for the Northern Plains or NDSU, Choice Flowering Crab Apples, whatever it may be. Dr. Dale Herman, when he was here at the time, and Larry Sheppey and now Todd West have, have done an extensive evaluation of the best crab apples for the Northern Plains. So you can go to that. It, it describes a number of crab apple cultivars with different parameters of leaf color, flowers, and, and you can kind of get uh, selecting. If you're looking for a crab apple, you can go that way and select. 
You can also go on the internet. J. Frank Nursery has what they call their crab apple chart, which lists a lot of crab apples, a lot of their uh, disease resistance, flowers, colors once again. So there, there's a lot of information out there. Um, and if you're really wanting a crab in your landscape, I, I guess I would really recommend researching it first and determining the one that you do really want for your yard. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Amur maples, uh, not a lot, but I'm going to talk about them because they are probably one of the most adaptable small maples that we can grow in the Dakotas. Um, Amur maple is not generally thought of, but Amur maple, as you can see in the photo here, it, it is a flowering tree. That yellow, uh, yellowish uh, clusters on there are flowers. It fl they flower fairly heavily in the spring. Um, most of them are seedling propagated that have been grown up to this date. Uh, they're used in, uh, again, in landscapes, in conservation plantings, very pH tolerant tree, small tree, 15 to 20 foot in height, 15 to 20 foot in spread. So very adaptable, grown as a single stem or multi-stem. So, so there are a lot. You know, one of the things we really like in our area is fall color. So amber maples provide that and uh, kind of put on an annual display for us in the fall. One way to ensure that is to look at the cultivars that are offered by the garden centers and nurseries in your area because there's been a lot of selection on amber maple now, uh, both for fall color. Um, on the left-hand side there, you can see that's a picture of campfire, but also red November and flame have brilliant red fall foliage. So if that's something you're looking for, there are cultivars that provide that. The other two pictures are of uh, other amber maple cultivars that have in the summertime the very bright red samaras on their seed wings. And you can see those and I have to explain it's not the flowers, it's the seed wings on the amber maples that are turning. So they're very bright through the summer months. So they kind of provide a nice, a nice color in the landscape and it lasts a long time, the color on those. Very closely related to Amur maple is Tatarian maple. In fact, they are, one is a subspecies of the other. So um, Tatarian maple, a little bit different in that it's a little bit heavier tree, uh, a little bit more upright, more easily trained into a single stem. And again, there's been a number of forms of those uh, introduced. Again, selected for the real red uh, Samaras, uh, several of them. Um, most of the ones that are available, Pattern Perfect, Hot Wings is, is the one that's really uh, popular, Rugged Charm. Again, selected for that. The Tatarian Maple are not as brightly fall colored as the Amur Maple. More of a yellow to yellow orange. Some may approach an orange red, but not as quite a bright color, but a little more of a substantial tree form. I'm going to go back one slide, and you can see the differences in form on some of the Tatarian. Uh, and the front here is, is hot wings, which uh, is more of a rounded with the bright red wings. Uh, on the back is, I believe it's uh, pattern perfect, much more upright type form for growing in the landscape. I do want to mention a few other small maples. Uh, we like maples, you know, we typically we plant a huge silver maple in our yard or attempt some sugar maples, um, but we don't go much beyond that. So there are some other small maples that we can incorporate, maybe give them a little better spot in the landscape um, and use them. On the uh, right slide there is, is just beginning uh, into fall is a small sugar maple called Apollo. And it is called Apollo because of the form of that tree. It's much like the space capsule Apollo for which it was named. But it's a very, very compact uh, sugar maple, 25 to 30 foot, 12 foot in width, uh, doing extremely well at our uh, Absaraco horticulture farm. And several of the nurserymen I talked to in South Dakota recently said it does very, very well for them also. So I, I think it's a plant that is, uh, is available and we can look at growing that in our area. Just a neat little tree. If you don't have room for the full size sugar maple, 60, 70 foot tall, 60, 70 foot wide, then certainly you can consider uh, Apollo sugar maple. I want to mention the Korean maples or Korean palmate maples. 
I think a lot of us visit either the east or west coast and some of those more moderate areas and wish we could grow the Japanese maples that are in those areas. Japanese, the true Japanese palmate maple is not hardy in our area. Uh, it's sometimes grown as an annual, incorporated into uh, container plantings, but it will generally not overwinter here unless it's very, very protected. But a close cousin of that, uh, of that, those palmate maples is Korean maple, or Korean palmate maple. Uh, it's got very silky spring expanding foliage, um, grows very, very well here, uh, kind of tends to grow in a multi-stem form, which which is nice in a, in a bed in a yard to have more of a multi-stem effect rather than just a uh, single stem effect. What's different about it is the foliage, uh, after it gets the fall color on it, is retained through the winter months, kind of a brown to orange brown color. Some people like that, some do not. But what that is is a protective mechanism for uh, to prevent uh, winter damage and sun scald on those stems on the Korean maple. This this tree is hardy to minus 35 to minus 40 consistently. It occurs at high elevations in South Korea and well up into North Korea, where it really gets the extremes up in that area. So it's a neat little tree. There is a uh, release from our program that is now becoming available called Northern Spotlight Korean Maple. If you're familiar with Isley Nursery, the premier dwarf conifer grower on the West Coast, they are now growing Northern Spotlight Korean Maple. And Isley Maple or Isley Nursery ships a lot of dwarf conifers into uh, nurseries in our area. So if you're interested in Korean Maple, maybe talk to your local garden center nursery person if they buy from Isley. See if they've got Northern Spotlight available as a small uh, Korean maple for this area. But the other thing we have done, we've tried several sources just of uh, seedling sources of Korean maple. And those sources have performed very well. They have a lot of cold hardiness. Seedlings of Korean maple or seedling grown Korean maple, I should say, are pretty generally available in a number of nurseries now both in this area and as if you get into Minnesota, a little more available over into that area. But again, it's another, another source of uh, a small maple, small palmate maple, which you can try in our area. I mentioned Isley Nursery. Uh, they've kind of taken it a step further as pretty much what we're doing in our program too, but they're taking the, the hardy Korean maple and then crossing that with the palmate maples, the Japanese palmate maples. Now, all of those hybrids have not been hardy here to date. We're a test location for them. I should say all but one. Uh, this cultivar, Northwind, has been very hardy for us, both in town and out at the Absarac Horticulture Farm. And North uh, Northwind is pretty readily available uh, at some of the larger nurseries now. And it's another palmate maple, comes out as kind of a bronzy green in the spring. Very nice, uh, attractive foliage through the summer. And then it gets kind of an orange bronze color on the foliage in the fall. And it does drop its leaves through the winter. It doesn't retain them. So it's another nice, small uh, palmate maple that, that is starting to catch on and being, being used in our area. I want to talk about some of the uh, small spring flowering tree forms, I call them. Some of these may even approach more of a tall shrub, but I'm going to include some of them. Um, you know, spring here, we like to see flowers. We like to see something bright, uh, something unique. So I'll talk about a few of these. And one of those that I really like that I, I've watched for a number of years is, is one called Northern Pearls Pearl Bush. It's just not a familiar plant to us here. It's in the genus Exocorda, which is not hardy here. But uh, again, we go to those Korean areas, higher altitudes, uh, northern areas, and there's another species there uh, called Ceratifolia, and the uh, University of Minnesota landscape, uh, or University of Minnesota, has selected a, uh, a plant from there that has been totally hardy, can be trimmed into a small tree form, uh, as I say, 9 to 12 feet in height. The bloom on here in mid-May is just when you're wanting to see something in flower, it's just covered with these bright white small flowers on a very attractive plant. So uh, if you can find Northern Pearl's Pearl Bush, it's been hardy in our area, provides some of that early, early spring color for us. 
Magnolias, people are always surprised when we say we can grow a couple magnolias here. And it's mostly within the uh, Magnolia stellata cobus lebneri group. These are northern Asian magnolias. They're deciduous. They lose their leaves each fall. A lot of people think of the southern magnolia and say, well, we can't grow that here. And that's right, we can't grow that here. But in northern Asia, there's, there's several species that are extremely hardy. There's been a number of selections from those. We've, we've trialed a number of those selections. Uh, several of them that have done fairly well for us. The first one is Royal Star Magnolia, and this is kind of uh, depending on where it's placed and how long it's grown. Could either be a tall shrub or trimmed into a small tree. Uh, very nice double flowers. Very nice summer foliage on it. Very very early though in bloom. This is going to bloom in early to mid May, and in a few minutes I'll talk about the dangers of blooming in early to mid May, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but. It's kind of a nice small tree, tall shrub. Another one is Merrill Magnolia. And Merrill is extremely hardy. It's been grown clear up into the northeast part of the state. Uh, it's a little bit a little bit shy or shyer in flowering than uh, than the other cultivars, but it's done very well. It's much more upright in form. It's much more um, tree form than the uh, Royal Star Magnolia. I mentioned another one at the bottom here that is showing up in our area. There's another one called Spring Welcome, which is actually an NDSU tree program release. And some nurseries in the area are starting to carry that. Once again, it's it's one of these similar northern Asian type magnolias with the uh, the white flower petals on it, bright white flower petals. So, so there's several that, that you can work in. Maybe put them in an area in your yard that's going to be a little protected. Maybe bloom a little bit later. Don't put it in an area where it gets a lot of early spring warmth on it. You want to delay that flowering as long as you can. Uh, this is what happens when they do bloom early. On your left, those aren't leaves on there. Those were flowers that came out. And then a very, very cold snap snow afterwards. So that, that's one of the dangers. And on the right side, if we get a severe winter, um, you know, very dry upper areas of the plants, severe cold on it. We can have flowering just below the snow line in some years. So in, in trying some of these and growing them, the, the plants still do fine, but you may not get that cold that you're, or, uh, that flowering that you're anticipating every year. So it's one of those things you got to be patient, take it when it's good and, and expect that you're not going to have it every year, but kind of a neat plants to work into a, a border type planting in a landscape. One of the earliest to bloom, and you see these in early May as you drive around, is uh, Prince's K flowering plum. And if you uh, see one of these in bloom and go up to it, the, the flowers are really amazing on them. They're, they're doubled flowers, very, very dense, almost like they're in a bouquet. Uh, this is a uh, Prunus nigra, it's a plum that is native actually to Canada. So it's a zone two uh, flowering plum. Very, very hardy for our area. Again, I don't like them planted just out in an open area, but if you can plant it in a little more intimate setting, you know, near an entryway or a patio, that early spring bloom on them is, is just really fantastic. Summer, it's typical foliage on it. Um, but uh, spring for something early, it's quite a striking plant to have in your landscape. One, a plant that's really not used in our area is one called service berry. Now, if we think of service berry here, we think of June berries. Uh, and these are, these are actually like the big brothers of June berries. Um, very early blooming, similar to, to June berry, but these are tree form. These will get 20 to 28 foot in height. I think the one in my backyard in Bismarck is actually pushing 30 foot. So they will get very tall, profuse bloom in the spring, white blooms, kind of white clouds. Again, early May, um, there's a number of cultivars. Cumulus is the one on the left here. Uh, Autumn Brilliance, Robin Hill, Luster. There's, there's many more than this, but really not used in our area. Um, they get a nice trunk caliper to them. A uh, nice structure, kind of a multi-stem structure going up. Very unique. And they do get fruit on them, similar to June berries, a little smaller. But you're not going to be picking them because you're going to be 20 foot up in the air if you are trying to pick them. So, uh, but if you like birds in your yard, the birds love these. They will 
hang from the branches trying to pull that fruit off in there. Um, Amber cherry is one of my favorite little trees. Um, does very well, it was, except in the situation where it's planted in full winter sun on a boulevard. You need to plant it in an area in your landscape where you can minimize that winter sun. They tend to get a little bit of bark cracking on them. Uh, other than that, for winter interest, the bark is really fantastic on them. Just kind of a coppery bronze. Uh, there's a lot of variation on it. Very early spring blooming. Again, early May. Uh, white flower clusters as the, as the foliage comes out. But but nice trees. But I do want to mention a, a new one that's out from Jeffrey's Nursery up in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Uh, and this is called Gold Spur. And it's a much smaller selection of amber cherry. Uh, 15 foot height, 10 foot width. And why it is smaller is that, that it's called the inner nodes. The distance between the buds is much shorter than on a typical amber cherry. So it gives it a very dense crown to it, a really attractive small tree. Um, these trees, the amber cherries, do fruit, but they get a very small kind of black purple fruit. Uh, ripens right around the 1st of July through about the 4th or 6th of July. But the birds are stripping these uh, before they even fall. They, they really like them. So uh, it's a good bird food. There's a couple other cultivars, Klon, Klondike and Ming, but they're both full-size amber cherries. And they were selected to have better resistance to winter bark damage on it. So we'll see how those hold up. It would be great if they do. A native little tree from uh, western Minnesota, east to the east coast, is pagoda dogwood. Pagoda has a, you'd think it was an Asian species, but this is a native dogwood. We can't grow the flowering dogwoods of the southeast up here, but this is a tree form dogwood, a paniculate, the flowers are in panicles, dogwood that's, that's hardy to zone three, um, just covered with white blooms in the spring. My wife and I have grown pagoda dogwoods for probably 15, 18 years. Uh, they're a real joy to watch them, the insects that come. As the fruits ripen on them, the profuse uh, uh, fruit set on them, and again, the birds will come and, and strip those uh, off of there. They'll, they'll hang right in the tree pulling those off. They ripen uh, in uh, August, you know, when a lot of other things aren't quite ripe yet, so pagoda dogwood forms a, uh, an early food form, but just a super little tree. They're not a drought tolerant tree. They like to be grown in a damp spot. If you've got an area on the north side of a house that stays cooler in the root run, you can mulch it. They do very well under those conditions. Um, a neat little tree that actually came out of the NDSU program is called Prairie Gem Flowering Pear. It's a Usurian pear. But it only gets 25 foot tall, 25 by 25, very, very dense branching in it. It's almost, a, I guess I would call it more of a dwarf form of Usurian pear, but dwarf and then again, it's, it's those shorter inner nodes that give it a very dense appearance. Early May, bright white blooms on it. Um, these trees look like they've been sheared, but this is the form that they grow in. Uh, if you go to the, uh, if you're at the Hector Airport, Airport here in Fargo, the north entrance, the very north entrance, not the south entrance, has a row of these planted along the road, and, and they, they really look neat in a, in a row situation like that as a formal entrance to the north side of the airport. But just a nice small, often uh, promoted for use under higher power lines, so neat little tree. Japanese tree lilacs, they've, they've now become uh, the go-to plant in a lot of areas, whether that's good or bad, it's hard to say. Most of them have been seedling grown up until this time, uh, but there now are a lot of cultivars coming out, uh, 15 to 20 foot, even 25 foot on some cultivars. But these bloom much later, mid to late June. All the other, the shrub lilacs are done in the spring, and then these big showy white large panicles come out. These are very, very soil and pH adaptable, uh, can just tolerate some horrible conditions. There's a row along south side of Kirkwood Mall in Bismarck that's been there for years. It gets the worst of traffic, salt, drought, everything. And they look great every year. They're just happy to be there. So they're, they're a neat little tree. On the right side, you can see two different forms. So the tree in the back is a seedling grown Japanese tree lilac. You really don't know what you're gonna get with that. 
just to the right of it on the other side of the sidewalk is a cultivar called ivory silk which is a much smaller compact uh, tree lilac which will get about 15 to 18 foot tall so there are a number of different cultivars uh, i list them here ivory silk is probably the most common one you can get snow cap uh, is going to be similar in form to ivory silk ivory pillar is more upright in form snow dance is out of bailey nursery in minnesota blooms very heavily with minimal seed production it does get some seed on it some people don't like the large panicles that persist on it others like it for the winter appearance but uh, snow dance produces much less of those panicles uh, snowstorm another smaller um, heavily blooming one and then golden eclipse is actually one with variegated foliage yellow and green foliage so you know if you want a, a tough tree for your landscape have a tougher spot the, the Japanese tree lilacs will very well uh, fit the bill for that area Pekin tree lilac from a distance you're going to think these are the same trees but actually the Pekin tree lilac is different from Japanese tree lilac and the, uh, the neatest thing about it, if you look on the right there, is uh, the uh, exfoliating bark that, that has been selected in a number of cultivars. Uh, exfoliating, peeling for the winter interest. Copper curls uh, is one out of NDSU. And then there's others, Beijing gold with yellowish flowers. And Summer Charm and China Snow have that exfoliating bark. Um, I'm always uh, kind of pushing Amarmachia. It's a tree that's just not used in this area. We need to trial it more. Uh, just kind of a small round-headed tree. Fantastic kind of orange coppery bark on it. It kind of sits there uh, in the landscape until mid-July and we have no other trees blooming in mid-July. And this thing bursts into flower with these spike-like flowers. If you have an interest in native pollinators, bumblebees, uh, butterflies, they swarm this tree by the thousands. So uh, when nothing else is blooming, Amarmachia, mid-July, sometimes into early August is blooming. And there's cultivars of this also, magnificent starburst in summertime. Very unique little tree. Wanted to mention Prairie Radiance, uh, Euonymus, not used a lot, but there's several nurseries that are growing it. Small tree. Uh, again, out of the NDSU program, but very well suited to our area. Um, sits there green, nice green foliage in the spring. It does get some flowers early, but pretty much none distinct flowers. But then red to uh, bright red in the fall, and the fruit in the upper right-hand side of the slide there, these bright red arils open up, and uh, then the birds take those through the winter. Uh, just finishing up, I want to mention one last little plant, uh, American Fringe Tree. Really hasn't been used in our area, but surprisingly hardy. Uh, this is another native plant, native to uh, the eastern U.S., pretty much up and down the whole eastern U.S. and out into the uh, uh, eastern Midwest. But uh, Native plant actually related to lilacs. It's in the same same olive type family, but for bloom for a native one of the native plants, this is just unsurpassed. We tried several sources. They grow very well. Um, they bloom in June. So again, we have another plant blooming in June. Uh, they're male and female flowers, very similar. But if you've got a bed area for a small plant, we don't quite know how big they're going to get in our area. Our largest ones are only approaching about six foot now, maybe a little over, but uh, widely available, but one worth trying if, if, if you're interested in trying something different in your area, interested in native plants. And some contact information here. So if any of you want to contact myself or Dr. West, information on here and, and you can get hold of us. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> let's have some questions out there. And Greg, that's just... I just love that presentation and those photos, and those are beautiful trees. Good. Okay, here's a couple of questions. Uh, one is, I don't, I don't think you ever got this one before. Uh, this guy wants to plant uh, one or two rows along his property line to filter spray drift from that comes from his neighbor before it damages his more sensitive trees. So do you have a good... Uh, filter or a barrier planting he suggests how about cedar or juniper would that be a good choice? those are the first that come to mind but if that's that much of a spray problem i guess i would maybe talk to your neighbor first 
I mean, if he's if he's drifting that much spray onto your property, but uh, as Tom mentioned, maybe eastern red cedar or Rocky Mountain juniper would be of the plants we have. I don't want to say tolerant because you can you can damage those also. So. Yeah. How about this person has a, a topiary lilac tree that's 19 years old? Do you have any advice about the best time to trim it, and in, in what shape to trim it in? <laughs> I don't. I, I'm a big lover of natural tree form. But with all the lilacs, whether they be shrub or tree, trim or prune them just after blooming, so that they set flower buds for the next year. If you if you wait until late and trim those heavily, you're going to be cutting off any flower buds that have formed in there. So so prune them after flowering, just after flowering, and in, into whatever form you may need. But I'm certainly no topiary expert at all. How about Apollo sugar maple? You're an expert on that. Okay. Yes. Is that more tolerant of a high pH soil than a regular sugar maple? A lot of that goes back, um, I suppose everybody heard the question on tolerance of high pH, what the rootstock is on. So those rootstocks, if they're coming out of Pennsylvania or wherever it may be on the East Coast, they're not going to be as tolerant to high pH. So we're hoping the nurseries that are propagating it are using Midwest Midwest uh, sugar maple rootstock. Our plants at Absaraca are growing on a pH of about seven eight seven nine. So it's not a low pH where they're growing. They're on a higher pH. You're doing fine. Great. How about uh, is the Apollo sugar maple and the Korean palmated maples are they prone to iron chlorosis? Goes back to that that pH problem. If you've got plants on your in your landscape that are already showing chlorosis, then certainly they may be. One of the things that, that we suggest everybody do is get a soil sample from your yard and see what your pH is, what problems there may be, um, available nitrogen. You know, pH is going to affect all these problems. Um, if you may have any salts in your soil, whatever it may be, but, but figure out what you're planting into before you plant into it. So. How tall do the Korean maples get? Initially, uh, height on Korean maples, initially I was thinking maybe 20 foot, but uh, my older plant, my, my personal plant is probably pushing uh, at least that now and, and into the low 20s on, uh, on height and spread. So in a, in a good area, they may get a little larger than that. So you may want to up it to about 22 by 22 or so. Uh, instead of the 20 by 18 or so, whatever I had before. How about uh, we got a hungry gardener here, and uh, those pagoda dogwood fruits look delicious. <laughs> uh, can she eat them and bite the birds over them? Are they edible? They're not suggested as edible. Uh, dogwood fruits, uh, if you can get past the extreme bitterness, would be edible. But uh, this is not considered one of the edible dogwoods. There are a number of edible dogwoods, but these. These are not considered as such. Okay. The service berry had the same prom as choke cherries with junipers. Would that be what you think? Oh, okay. Yeah. A question on, uh, on, on, on the service berries and junipers. Cedar apple rust. And uh, if you've got a lot of junipers, uh, eastern red cedar, Rocky Mountain juniper, they're both in the juniper family. And they are the alternate host for seed or apple rust, and and the apple family being the other, other host, um, then there could be problems with it. Yeah, look in your area if you have cedar apple rust on your crab apples and apple trees, then you may you may be prone to cedar apple rust in your area. On service berry. On service berry. How about yeah. juneberry? Anything with juneberry? Same thing. Yep. yep. <clears throat> How about uh, you showed a picture of that magnolia that got hammered. So that you only saw a few blooms at the bottom below the snow line. So how would you trend that situation? What would you do about that? All you would do is just uh, give it its normal normal care the following season. What happens, the flower buds may freeze off, but the vegetative buds where the leaves come out do not freeze off. You know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leaf out normally and be a normal plant. Um, you're just not going to have flowers that year, much like on an apricot where you can freeze all the flowers off early, but the tree still 
leaves out and grows normally. It just won't have fruit that year. Same situation on these hardy magnolias. Greg, how come you don't respect Russian olives as a specimen tree in a yard? Huh? A beautiful orange bark and yep, yep. Uh, interesting foliage color. Come on, bluish green. I, I used to grow 300,000 300, Russian man. olive a year. How many did you grow? 300,000 a year. Is that all? Wow. Yeah. No, a so Russian, olive, a Russian olive, as we reach the central Dakotas moving west, that is one of the primary trees that does well in, in our landscapes. And I would never tell anybody not to plant it. Um, in fact, you get to the western edge of the state, that's going to be a plant that actually will do well for you. So very saline tolerant, high pH tolerant, uh, you know, very intense fragrance in the flowering, attractive silver foliage. Um, so, yeah. Okay, good. How about uh, the hardiness of the North Korean maple? Or maybe it was that North Wind Korean maple? Uh, North Wind Korean maple. We know it's hardy down to about minus 30 to 32, 34. We haven't pushed it beyond that. So uh, where the straight Korean maple or the northern spotlight selection are hardy to minus 40, uh, we're just not sure how low the uh, north wind Korean hybrid maple will go. How about uh, this person has a, a Merrill Magnolia? Called Dr. Merrill Magnolia? Dr. Merrill, same thing. It's uh, 10 years old and it's covered in large white flowers every April. This person's from Cass County. Uh, do you think this spring may be the exception? I don't think so. We haven't gotten that cold this winter. The, the temperature is, is what affects it. I mean, I say we haven't gotten that cold. Obviously, it's been cold. But, but when we talk about damage to flowers, we're talking down in the mid minus 30s um and we haven't had that in in the in in this central part of the state eastern part of the state we've been down to minus 26 minus 28 but but haven't gone lower than that so and the buds are still protected from yeah the yeah storm. and the buds have not started pushing yet so the other flip side is people talk about wind chill plants care nothing about wind chill the wind chill can be 80 below and the, the plant isn't affected by that unless the temperature is 35, 45 below. Um, but wind chill doesn't matter to a plant. So, you know, they should be fine as long as we haven't reached that critical low temperature. And she should send me her address. I'd like to see her tree. Well, okay. Uh, you got that, Rhonda. How about um, what's so special about spring welcome? Magnolia. Spring Welcome is one that's been was selected by Dr. Herman here from a population, and it's done very well, uh, as hardy as the others. Um, pretty essentially more of a tree form than the Royal Star Magnolia, a little more spreading than Merrill, so it, it's kind of in between those. Uh, blooms profusely with a good flower bud set on it. So, and it's starting to be produced now, and and at least in in this area, uh, eastern North Dakota is starting to show up in nurseries and being offered. So it's another one we can grow. Okay, we're gonna go quickly here. What do you think about? Uh, well, how about uh, the mag magnolia and the Princess K palm? Are they good for pollinators? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, the magnolias. Yes, early, the very early bumblebees, and I assume she's talking about working the flowers. Right. The very early bumblebees will work the flowers on the magnolias, yeah. And that's an early source of, of, uh, of pollen for them. The magnolias are big pollen producers, so that's, that's what they'll be grabbing early. The Princess K plum, um, it is slightly fertile. I do see some fruit. I guess I've never looked at it to see what is working at that time on it. double flowers maybe yeah it, way, it may be lesser yeah um do you have a recommended tree for a boulevard how about that for an open question uh it depends on the site but the <laughs> japanese tree lilacs are extremely hardy uh again you know check and see what form they have at the uh, nurseries but but if it's a tough situation japanese tree lilac would be a great one um i didn't talk about any of the bigger trees today and uh, if you're looking for a larger tree on a boulevard, that there's certainly a lot of choices for that, uh, especially as we diversify because of emerald ash borer. But there's a number of elm cultivars, some maple cultivars, lindens. So there's a lot of 
there's a lot of boulevard trees, which really wasn't a part of this talk, but uh, certainly if you want a recommendation or you want to talk more, feel free to email me at any time. So, Greg, we have a question from our YouTube live stream. There is a lilac that was developed for zone three or four that has purple and dark purple on the same flower. I can't remember the name. Do you know if that lilac is long lived? Okay, a lilac with purple and dark purple on the flowers. I, okay, the only thing I can uh, that I can think of is uh, uh, a bicolored flower called Sensation. It's one of the shrub lilacs, and it does have a dark purple with a lighter, light purple edging to it. So Sensation lilac, and it does very well in our area. And it's a, it's a larger uh, uh, shrub type lilac, so that'd be the one that would come to mind. Yeah, lilacs live a long time unless they're do. in a wet spot. Yeah. That's their yeah. only weakness. Yep, they prefer to have it drier and a little tougher. Speaking of wet spots, uh, do you have a recommendation for a good small tree in a wet area but out in the open country? <laughs> uh, boy, off the top of my head, I guess it'd be a little difficult. I, I don't know what they mean by wet. Um, you know, most of the most of the flowering trees I talked about like a well-drained soil, uh, with the exception if you get into some of the willows and, and those type areas. But uh, I guess I wouldn't have. I mean, if you're going to be in the open, you're going to need a pretty tough plant under that situation. Maybe a tall shrub. Or like tall a, shrub, like yeah. Flame well yeah. or something like that. Yeah, or, or yeah, depending on the soils, even even mm -hmm. American cranberry, whatever it may be. Uh, getting back to Russian olives, one of your favorite trees, are they invasive? Russian olives in the right environment are extremely invasive. So that's why a number of states, they can still be planted in uh, North Dakota, Montana, but Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, all the intermountain states have uh, prohibited the use of Russian olive. What we're working on and some of the early work I did is hybrids with Russian olive and silverberry are a little native Ely Agnes. And those hybrids are sterile, but they grow more in a multi-stem form. But uh, Jeffrey's Nursery carries those, Silverscape and Silverado. If you want that silver color, but not invasive, then those would be the ones to go to. Uh, any suggestions? Like how, to, uh, how do you keep deer out of a magnolia? <laughs> the, the only way to keep deer out of anything is to fence them. Or kill them. How about a uh, pagoda dogwood? How does that do in alkaline soil? Pagoda dogwood does not like alkaline soil. Um, alkaline, I assume you mean salts in it. Um, it it's not going to be a salt tolerant. It does grow on mid to mid to upper sevens in a in a well drained uh, damp soil, but uh, it's not a it's not a substitute for those things that will tolerate high pH. Okay, so I'm gonna. Keep you, you're just too wise. You have too much information. Okay. So we have to keep your answers short. Um, Greg, what do you, and these are, these people are going to push the envelope here. <laughs> Ohio Buckeye, you got a quick comment on that? What yeah, think about I, it? I love Ohio Buckeye. Um, seedling grown, there's a lot of seedling grown, but what's your planting seedling grown now are the cultivars. Uh, Autumn Splendor and Homestead are widely available. Two great trees with better summer foliage quality that do extremely well in our area and well into Canada. How about uh, Regal Prince Oak? Hey, Regal Prince, it's early in our trials. It's performed well to date. Uh, very nice, very columnar upright oak. We don't have enough uh, data on it now to see how it performs. If you want an upright oak that does super here, uh, beautiful upright, very densely upright is Crimson Spire. And it turns a beautiful orange in the fall. Uh, just a great tree, very, very upright oak. So, okay, and this this is kind of illegal, but I'm going to ask you this anyhow. Somebody asked about autumn blaze, Freeman maple. It is it is a small tree when it's young, so I guess it, we can. Oh sure, when we have the, <laughs> when you the plant first it. three or four years, <laughs> yes. Yeah, one sends on autumn blaze. Are you for it or against it? Autumn blaze is a nice tree. Mm -hmm. We tend to get some chlorosis and uh, winter damage and severe winters here. Uh, it's got a nice form to it. There are other Freeman maples uh, that do as well or better to versify. Uh, Firefall, Firefall from University of Minnesota is a great tree, Sienna Glen. Uh, there's some others of those, and I'll be talking on maples 
uh, April 21st at the Bismarck That's right, the Dakota, Dakota Garden, Garden, Dakota Garden Expo. Biggest, and biggest I'm Expo talking just on Florida. maples at, the, there you at go. that show. One last question. Uh, what would you recommend as far as a small tree in a high clay content soil? Uh, the tree lilacs, Pekin lilac, Japanese tree lilac, Amur cherry, all have performed very well under those situations. Okay, Greg, that is outstanding. Just love this talk. And there are, there will be a field day in Absarac uh, this exactly. summer. Yep. So how do they find out about that? Uh, field day should come out through uh, notice through the extension. Uh, Esther McGinnis, the Eastern North Dakota. Uh, extension horticulturalist puts out a blurb and tries to get it out to the newspapers each year but be looking around the third fourth week of August for open house at Absaraca it would be great if we would have a couple hundred people out there uh, we get 60 70 80 but uh, we can certainly adapt to uh, twice or three times that so keep that in mind if you want to see a lot of these trees uh, it's a great place to do it okay thank you Greg again and uh Always welcome here. Thanks for your contribution tonight for the sure. like forum. So we'll Thank you. Catch you next year. Thank you, Thank you Greg. Yep. Okay, we're going to take a quick five-minute break, and then we're going to talk about elms. Take a break.